Hey there, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. So uh, welcome to this panel discussion. We're going to be talking about data storytelling in action, basically. So today we have three expert speakers with us who will share their insights and experiences on this very important topic. So my name is Albert Wahab, and I am a data scientist here at Data Science Dojo, and I'll be moderating this discussion. This panel discussion on data storytelling in action can provide immense value to individuals who are interested in learning more about the practical applications of data storytelling. So through their experiences and successes, the experts today will be sharing with you valuable insights on how data storytelling can be used to solve uh, business problems, make informed decisions, and effectively communicate some complex information to different stakeholders, either technical or non-technical. So the limitations and challenges that will be shared by the panelists today will help everyone understand how you can avoid some common pitfalls and challenges that you might encounter and during your data storytelling journey and how you can develop some effective strategies to overcome those obstacles. So overall, this discussion is aimed at helping everyone gain a deeper understanding of the power that you can harvest by data storytelling and how you can leverage it to drive positive outcomes in a different variety of industries. Let me just go ahead and start off by introducing our speakers. Uh, so we have with us Nick Debra, who is an independent educator and consultant who has taught data visualization and information dashboard design to thousands of professionals in over a dozen countries. And then we also have with us Cam uh, Camila Manera. She is the chief data officer at Liberal the Passes and accomplished data scientist in the entertainment industry. Before we get started, I would like that we go around the room and have the speakers provide a little bit of information and background about themselves to the viewer, about who they are and what has their experience been so far in the field of data analytics and storytelling. So Nick, why don't you start us off? Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. In terms of my background, uh, I started way back when as a, as a developer, uh, moved into various different roles, uh, product management, uh, marketing, even did a bit of sales for a while. But, uh, you know, I've had a longstanding interest in psychology, psychology of decision-making, perception. I went to a Stephen Few workshop. A lot of you probably know who Stephen Few is in 2013 uh, and ended up actually uh, teaching his courses, uh, which I did from 2013 to 2019, data visualization, dashboard design uh, courses. And then since uh, Steve retired in about 2019, and so since then, uh, I've actually developed uh, several of my own courses, which of course I've had to teach online <laughs> as opposed to in person. Prior to pandemic, I was teaching all over the world. And since then, I've been thankfully very busy uh, teaching those online. I am an author. The book's not quite out yet, uh, but it'll be out uh, in the summer. It's called Practical Charts. That sounds great. Thank you, Nick. Camila, why don't you take the lead next? Yes, thank you very much for, for being here and being part of this amazing conference. Uh, to start a little bit talking about myself, I always say that I have a very like strange profile because uh, I started studying arts and graphic design. And, and in the term, I, I started working for the Walt Disney Company as a part of the creative team. I discovered my passion for tech and data and AI. So in that meantime, I started studying a lot of different courses to like introduce myself in the tech world, not for the like from the front side, but from the back. And in that journey, I started studying uh, make a postgraduate program in AI, and I started seeing all the potential that we were having with this technology, uh, with data, and and how we could be empowered of all this information. Uh, so that's why I have changed internally into create uh, the data strategy team for Latin America. And in that journey, I, I have been very focused in the part of storytelling, uh, mainly because I was part of one of the best storytelling companies in the world. So I have the chance to use all the story and the power of that in order to make and take really business decisions and data into action. That was my main focus and my main point. Now I am on the other side. I'm not in a big company. I'm in the startup world as a chief of data. So I have the chance to also understand all the problems of being part of a small company and all the advantages of, the advantages of being there. Uh, so that's a little bit about my experience and my journey and how I really make storytelling data into action was my main focus in my last uh, five to six, seven years. That sounds great. Thank you, Camila. Let's kick off our panel discussion. Let's start off with a very general question. For starters, what is data storytelling and why do you think it is important in uh, today's business environment? So, Camille, would you like to start? 
Yes, definitely. I think that storytelling data, it's the way of make real use of data in the day by day and, and take business decisions. Uh, this sounds great when you say, because it sounds like, okay, uh, this is the way where I have to go. But the real importance of this is that once we, we start seeing all the evolution of the data and all the data that we were having, the data was in a lot of places, we were seeing that our day by day, it was going to change because this usage of data. But when you go to the reality, you can see that most of the people have a lot of information, but it was really, really hard to make that information into a business decision, into a change, into a project, into something. So that's the part where storytelling came into place. And also, uh, I think that it was one of my like key advantages uh, because I came from the art and the creative world. So I have very in my mind how I have to communicate things in order to uh, have people listening to me to in the other side, no? Because we can do a lot of things, but if we don't create an impact or an action, our work is not going to be evaluated and used. And we all want to, if we make an amazing analysis and we were like one map creating an, uh, an algorithm, a, a model, a strategy, a visualization, we want that to take into consideration. So I always say that the storytelling, it's like a 50-50 part of the job because if we are just focused in making a great analysis, but we can't take that into a, a information that somebody on the other side can take insights, our job is not already done. So I think that this is part of the process. It's a tool that we can use in order to uh, understand our audience. Who are we final users? Where what team I'm working on? Where are their problems? Where are their main pains? And with all that information, I have the chance to create a story with the data that I have, no? Uh, and I think that's the key and that's the place and, and the way I see it, the, the storytelling, uh, because it sounds quite pretty and it's amazing to apply it, but it's very difficult also. So uh, I think that uh, working for also a, a big company that was in the data uh, transformation process also. That sounds great. And that must definitely be uplifting for people that are coming from an arts background that they can definitely succeed in the field of data storytelling. So Nick, the same question to you. How would you describe data storytelling and how do you think it's important in today's environment? I guess, I mean, I've always had a bit of a problem with the term storytelling, right? Because I, I like to try and use words in the way that people use them in everyday conversation. And so when people hear like just you know, pick somebody off the street and say, what does a story mean to you? Well, they'll say things like, well, it had something with a beginning, middle, and end, or it's something with characters, or something that follows a story, like a narrative arc. And I think a lot of the things that, for example, Camilla was just talking about, actually kind of fall outside of that, and yet are very useful, right? Uh, things like really putting ourselves into the, you know, the, the, the shoes of, of the end user of, you know, not just kind of spraying data at them, but really thinking about like, what are their problems? What are their needs? How can I really, you know, sort of hone this towards those specific, uh, you know, needs that they have. And so those are all things that were, that are worth doing. It's just in my experience, most of the techniques that we tend to use in order to do that. I would call more like enhanced data communication techniques, right? These are techniques which we need to use when just showing the data isn't going to cut it, right? It's not going to be persuasive enough or it's going to be too complicated or it's going to be too overwhelming. And so then we need to have these sort of higher level data communication skills, which can even be really simple things like, for example, just highlighting specific parts of a chart or putting call outs and annotations saying, hey, this is the important thing in this chart or including you know, recommended actions. This is what I think we should do in response to this information, right? So those are all very useful and very important things and things that unfortunately people more specifically kind of data analysts don't do, right? They think their job, my job is basically to put information on a screen, right? And any sort of interpretation of that information, not my job or it's up to the user. And so I think that really the whole kind of data storytelling movement has been very useful to say that's not enough, right? In most situations, we need to go beyond just showing the data and to include essentially our interpretation of the data uh, along with it. And I know that makes people uncomfortable sometimes, but, and so but the bottom line is I, I wish we had come up with a different term because so many of those kind of enhanced data communication techniques don't really 
fall under what most people would call a story, right? Like if I just put an annotation that says, hey, you know, this is what I think we should do about this, or this is what I think is the most important part of the chart. Is that is that a story, right? Are there characters? Does it have a beginning, middle, and end? Not really. And yet it's still, in many cases, a really good thing to do. So kind of an unusual take maybe, but that's how I see sort of data storytelling is it's, it's a great concept. It's a great idea with an unfortunate name. That sounds about right. Thank you, Nick. So right now we have joining us Kristen Kerr. So Kristen Kerr is a developer advocate at Comet and a LinkedIn top voice in data science and analytics. So welcome, Kristen. Would you like to go ahead and introduce uh, yourself to our viewers? I am a developer advocate for Comet. Uh, Comet helps you make your ML training runs reproducible and monitor models in production. And I have been a data scientist since 2010. My background, uh, my degrees are in math and statistics. So I'm coming from that side. And I've worked in healthcare, the utility industry, e-commerce, and I even spent some time working on my own doing consulting and teaching. Thank you, Kristen. So Kristen, we were just going around the room and everyone was sharing their thoughts on what they think is data storytelling, what is their understanding of data storytelling and how it is important in today's business environment. So do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. And I, I love what Nick said. And a lot of the techniques are really simple. Um, and I absolutely agree with the techniques that he was talking about. I personally gone into data storytelling. It's been like this slow, iterative thing where, you know, I, I started and I'd put a chart for every single thing. And then, you know, over time, I've learned that I might pick a single person and really blow out, you know, what did that model say for this particular person? Um, and there is, you know, when I'm working with people and not in the utility industry, there does seem to be like a little bit of a real story, especially if, you know, the drivers are things that, you know, have cause and effect, right? Um, and you're, you're able to sort of tease a little bit. And um, yeah, so, you know, my goal, what I think of when I think of data storytelling is I want to put things together in a way so that when my stakeholders walk away, they will actually remember some of what I told them. Right, right. So uh, I guess we can agree on a common ground about data storytelling regarding that, right? So Nick uh, and Kristen, for both of you, I would like to know that how do you incorporate storytelling elements like character, plot, what, what do you incorporate in your data storytelling projects that when your stakeholders leave, they keep that in mind, uh, they don't forget about it? Like what exactly are the elements? So uh, Nick, if you want to go ahead. Uh, sure. So yeah, like I, I really like what Kristen said about sort of cause and effect, right? I think that's really powerful. You can say, not just like, this is what happened, or this is the current state of things, but this happened, which then we think anyways, caused this to happen, which in turn caused this to happen. That's much more meaningful to people. It's certainly much more memorable. Uh, and something like that, I think, starts to actually approach what most people would call a story per se, like at least there's a sequence of events, for example. And so really I see sort of two categories there of, of things that people call data storytelling. There's what I call essentially non-story techniques, which are just like highlighting the most important part of a chart or just putting a call out in saying, you know, a recommended action. And then there's actual, you know, things that most people would refer to as stories where like, instead of just showing sort of highly aggregated data, we, sh we pull one person out of it and talk about that one person, for example, and saying, yeah, I have something like a sort of a character, uh, which again, I think is more what people would actually, most people would actually call kind of a story or storytelling. And so, I, to be honest, I tend to do mostly the first category, which is essentially techniques that uh, where we're essentially overlaying our interpretation of the data uh, onto, you know, charts and presentations uh, and dashboards, which again, a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with, but uh, at least that sort of seems to be shifting. Uh, you know, I think, you know, putting actual like sort of at least theories about like, if I, if I think I know why this is happening, share it with the audience. Right. And so, you know, and highlighting the most important parts of the chart, those are subjective judgment calls, of course, based on our own interpretation of the data. And so that's mostly what I talk about is these sort of non-story enhanced data communication techniques, which really do help people retain the information, you know, as Kristen was saying, that's, you know, super important. Yeah, to make sure that they get the important elements from, you know, our chart or dashboard presentations as well, because we're telling them what the, the, the important elements are. In terms of the kind of the second 
sort of type of, of storytelling, which is really sort of what most people would refer to as storytelling, like where you have characters and, uh, you know, or, or anecdotes or some kind of story arc or something. To be honest, I don't do all that much of that. Uh, I find myself needing to do it sometimes, but in a relatively small minority of, of situations. Now, when those situations arise, though, having those, you know, storytelling techniques in your back pocket where you actually talk about a typical user or a typical a class example of like the little girl in poor village, as opposed to talking about statistics about poverty. Absolutely. You know, very, very powerful. It's just like I said, I find myself needing to use those kinds of story, you know, true story techniques uh, less often than the sort of general kind of enhanced data communication techniques, which aren't necessarily kind of stories per se. Yeah, that sounds good. So whenever you're presenting your reports and your visualizations towards your stakeholder, right, you would want to make sure that your analysis is easy for the audience to understand. And I believe that can be a major problem for a lot of people making sure that the right story is communicated to the right audience. It might involve a technical audience and a non-technical audience. And you would, like, as you said, you want to make sure that they retain that information once they uh, leave that session, right? So Camilla, how would you perhaps generate a different visualization for different people? Like how do you make sure that your analysis is compelling and targeted at the right audience? Yes, going again for what we are seeing before, Every time we think about storytelling, uh, although we are perhaps working on a more like ML model, or, uh, data visualization or something, I love to say that it always begin with, uh, with a business problem, no? And that business problem came from a user or a people inside the team that has uh, something that they need to solve. Uh, I think that once you understand very good uh, who is that stakeholder or use, final user that you're working on, you can start saying, okay, uh, this person needs to have those, this all information or they just want to see a graphic. They want to uh, digest the, the, the data or they want to play with their data. It's going to be interactive or there's going to be a PDF. With all that things, you start like making like the process and, and understanding it much more like in your brain in order to see, okay, what is my purpose? It's my objective of this, what I want to do and what the final users want to do. In that understanding, you start defining uh, these parts, you know, how it's going to be, uh, you, although you need to like identify the data, where's the data, there's a lot of part of this process that have to be defined, but going uh, mainly in the part of storytelling, I, I think that the key there, it's when you define the purpose and you understand really the problem of the final user. Uh, that is not, it seems easy, but it's not easy because not everybody that came to you with a problem, they present the real problem that they're having because sometimes they don't even understand it. And there you find something that you need like a double word because you have to say, okay, let's talk. Uh, I need to understand a little bit more. Where is your, your data? What are you doing? Uh, I think that when you understand that, the really impact of storytelling, it's going to be much effective. And also, I, I love to say that we are talking like for the last years about storytelling, and it seems to be like a very uh, trend or something like that. But it's not like uh, something that we want to impose because it's a trend and, and just like that. Uh, it's like... Uh, it's a fact and it's like quite comprobated that when you tell something with a story, uh, your brain return is 22 times more. I, I want also to say this because sometimes you say, okay, but why I have to spend all this time doing all this? Because all that work, the other work, it's also a lot of time. You have to add more stuff, but it's because uh, you're going to do stuff that it's going to have real impact. And I think that there it's the key. And I think that listening, uh, it's, also a, a key advantage that we need to develop uh, when we are working in this uh, uh, industry. Thank you, Camilla. So, so you mentioned that uh, there might be instances when your stakeholders don't know the problems themselves, right? So uh, Kristen, Nick, Camilla, have any of you guys ever encountered that scenario? And how, how do you deal with it? I mean, of course, you must have encountered the scenario where the stakeholders aren't aware of the problem themselves. So how do you deal with that? How do you figure this issue out then? So, uh, Nick, would you like to share? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, this has, of course, been said a few times already, which doesn't surprise me, but it really, it, you know, I, I call it getting inside of the audience's head, like knowing their world. There are no shortcuts. You know, you just have to understand the environment in which they're operating, 
sit in in meetings, you know, even if they're not going to be talking about reporting or anything like that, they're just talking about general strategy or, or they're planning for next quarter. Uh, you know, you just have to get in to, uh, to understand, like, what are the specific challenges that they're facing? Uh, what are their objectives? Uh, you know, what do they, uh, what are the kinds of problems that they typically worry about? And yet it's not easy, right? Like you have to become a bit of an expert in their world, right? Like if you're at an insurance company, then you just have to start learning a whole lot about insurance so that you can understand, you know, what the needs are of these insurance experts. And so it's unfortunate, like I said, because it's time consuming. There are no shortcuts. It involves, like I said, sitting in on a lot of meetings, you know, asking people to CC you on internal communications, even if they don't think that it's directly relevant to you because it's not really a data issue or a reporting issue at that point. And so really to me, that's kind of the, you know, uh, the huge kind of missing piece in a lot of situations is where a data analyst who might have a lot of experience, you know, working with data and building, you know, different types of reporting and dashboards and presentations, and then they come in and they think, oh, well, I'm an expert in data. And so then they just start generating reporting. But, you know, if they're really new in that environment, you know, maybe they're a new hire or something, they're, they're, they're going to be way off a lot of the time, right? They're going to be presenting information that people, for example, just find really obvious. It's like, well, of course, everybody knows that in our organization, you know, thanks for wasting our time. And so, yeah, so really, to me, that's, that's very often the biggest missing piece is just the long hours and days and weeks of really getting inside the audience's head and understanding how they work, what are their problems, what are their challenges. Uh, and so as a, as a consultant, I'm always very careful about that to basically say, like, I'm not, you know, I can help you with general principles of, well, specifically data visualization and dashboard design in my case, but I'm not going to actually generate any reporting or anything for you because I have, I have not nearly enough understanding of your specific situation in order to do that. I will train the people who, who are in your organization who do have that knowledge, but you know, I do not. And it would take me a long time to get there with any new organization that I were to get involved with. So, so uh, Kristen, would you like to add something to that? Um, yeah, sure. So exactly adding on to exactly where, where Nick was going, um, you know, I've worked on a lot of teams where there has been a lot of friction between the data team and the stakeholders. And sometimes, you know, it might be because they're looking to run hypothesis tests that, you know, for some reason aren't going to work out, maybe it's sample size, whatever, or they're looking for, you know, ad hoc analyses that we're not going to give them because maybe we have self-service reporting already available or we're working on a more higher value initiative than, you know, the thing that's going to take a day or so. And so, um, you know, that friction can impact everything, you know, and it impacts your ability to give a presentation, um, you know, and have them actually like listen and, and really, um, process what it is you're saying and 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 the way that you get through that is just like Nick was saying you, you go through you know you go to their stand-ups you invite them to your stand-ups uh you know create processes wherever you can around different things so that because when that relationship is good with your stakeholders it's uh, so much easier to have you know, open dialogue to talk through um, the different, you know, pieces of a presentation that maybe, you know, you'll have more ears, people will be listening, um, and really just like work ends up being more positive in general. But I think that, you know, it's a very common thing for there to be friction between the data team and their stakeholders, depending on what industry you're in. Agree. Thank you, Kristen, for that. So, Nick, and I, I believe you mentioning that at points, what happens is that you present an analysis and the feedback is that this is something that we already knew. This was information that was already obvious, right? So how do you go about measuring the success of your data storytelling project? Is this a good metric for that? Or do you use any other metrics instead? Um, well, like I said, you know, I don't actually generate reporting for my clients because I don't know enough about their world. I train the people who, who generate those, uh, those reports. Uh, and yeah, in terms of kind of measuring success, really, it depends on what I think, well, my opinion anyways, it depends on what prompted that 
you know, reporting that data story, that presentation to be created in the first place. Uh, sometimes it's it's very direct, right? Like you've been asked a specific question and you are basically just presenting the answer. And so really the measure of success around that is like, did they understand the answer? Were they satisfied with the answer? Or did they come back and say, well, that wasn't really the question I was asking? Or is it clear that they've maybe completely misinterpreted your answer? Uh, something like that. Whereas if sometimes, you know, the the sort of originator of the product, the data product, whatever it is, is actually us. You know, we're a data analyst, we've discovered a problem, and now we need to communicate that to somebody. So nobody's asked us for anything. There's something has arisen, and then we need to then uh, communicate that. And so in that case, of course, it's, you know, it's very simple. It's like, did they, again, you know, did they understand the problem or the opportunity that I was communicating, you know, that I surfaced? Uh, there's sort of a, I guess, a bit of a third situation, which is, I think, what the situation that is most commonly sort of, that people most commonly have in mind when they're talking about storytelling, which is persuasion, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to get the audience to do something. So it's not just they need to understand something or be aware of something. There's some kind of action that we want them to take. And so I think very often people think, oh, we need a data story because we need to get them to actually do something, right? We need to get them to we need to get people to get vaccinated or we need to, you know, try and convince management to green light our project. And so then we use a data story to be more persuasive. And in that case, also, you know, the evaluating the effectiveness is, is pretty straightforward. It's like, well, did they do what we wanted them to do? Right. <laughs> if they did, then it's a success. And if they didn't, then it's a failure or, you know, whatever we were proposing was maybe a bad idea in the first place or, or whatever. And so that's sort of generally speaking, how it's, I would sort of evaluate the effectiveness of a data story. It really depends on what prompted that story to be created in the first place. Camilla, would you like to elaborate on this as well? Yes, definitely. I think that the, the key here, it's like, to make the data useful, as, as Nick uh, Good said, uh, because there are, I think that you have like different red flags that you have to listen when you are working on this. And as I mentioned before, uh, as my point of view says, uh, it's it all begins with a business problem or a question. So I think that is a good measurement of the success of your analysis or what you're presenting. And, and I think that the, the key there is, that, you, for example, if they came with an hypothesis and they say, OK, we were thinking this, but we have to do this. Or if you are presenting uh, a lot of analysis once, once again, and you are seeing like months go by and there is any action of what you're planning through this, uh, how the teams are like uh, analyzing that information and, and doing uh, really things with, with that. Uh, that are for me like the main KPI of, of all this because uh, in there you're going to see uh, the impact of what you're doing and you can start saying, okay, uh, but I'm not uh, communicating in the bad way. If you want to like sharing an analysis of a problem that it's not going very good, how it's your tone, uh, the colors of what you're showing. Uh, there are a lot of different elements that we can use, uh, but I think in in order to... Uh, take like two red flags of of the of the using of this data. It's from one side seeing not action at all if in anything that we are doing, and if that question uh, that that starts in the beginning has not been solved. I think that there it's the it's the moment where we have to go inside again with the team and say, okay, uh, this is not the way. What we have to change? Make uh, quick wins and start to making changes and analyzing if that. Uh, it's it's a good way of of continuing with uh, what we are doing uh, as a team. That sounds great. Thank you, Camilla. So let's shift uh, the gears a bit, right? So let's dive into more about some problems and inconveniences and challenges that you encounter when you're working with data storytelling. So let's just I just want everyone to share an example of a project where they faced any sort of challenges when telling stories with it data and how did you manage to overcome them? So any personal anecdotes that you have, our viewers would love to listen. So Kristen, would you like to share? I think one of the things that I wanted to mention is like, you, you also can't make a good story happen. Like sometimes you do an analysis and there's just not anything interesting. And so as many times, as hard as you try, you're not going to be able to get, you know, an interesting story out of it. But if we're going for present sharing presentation fails, uh, you know, in the beginning of my career, I built a, this was 2010, I built a neural net model to forecast hourly electric load. 
And then I went to go present this to my stakeholders, my, you know, non-technical stakeholders. And I had, you know, the functions behind a neural net on there. I had, uh, you know, just all this sort of stuff. And in my head, I thought I sounded smart. And no one knew what I was talking about, like not even a, not even a little bit, um, you know, and, and that's sort of a theme for how I've learned along the way what belongs in a presentation and what doesn't, you know, because even years later, I thought I had this amazing 3D visual and it was, you know, a little fish coming over and, um, you know, and it was jumping into this bowl that was this 3D visual. And my boss looks at it and is like, no one's going to be, you know, like if, if somebody hasn't taken like, you know, a three dimension, you know, a, a math course that involves three dimensions or whatever, how do you think they're going to read that graph? And it's like, that didn't even, that didn't even click in my head. So almost everything that I've learned along the way has been a series of fails that has led to, you know, ex- how I should be presenting to other people. But um, yeah, those are a couple examples of some tough times presenting that I've had. Uh, that's re- relatable, honestly. So Nick, do you have any data storytelling project that didn't go as planned and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, definitely uh, some of the you know similar uh, incidents that uh, Chris was, was describing of, you know, it's always so tempting to include, uh, you know, a lot more detail so people really understand, you know, where did the conclusions come from? But yeah, like she's right, you know, nine times out of 10, people, uh, 10, people just don't care how the sausage was made, you know, so like, tell mm-hmm. me what the the end result is. You want to, of course, have the, you know, the backups, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the raw data or, you know, some, some more detailed charts or, you know, descriptions of the, the functions that were used. You want to have those in your back pocket. So if somebody starts digging and says, well, hey, you know, how, how did you come to that conclusion? Then, you know, have that in your back pocket, but it's not necessarily part of your main presentation. And probably nine times out of 10, you're, you're not going to use it. But in my sort of just sort of looking around and seeing like, you know, where do I see uh, you know, data stories really kind of failing and not yielding the results that people were hoping for. In a lot of cases, and this is going to sound kind of self-serving, but you know, it most you know data stories contain charts of some type, right? Yeah, you, know, you know, usually multiple charts, and most people are lacking what I call the basic kind of spelling and vocabulary of data visualization, just fundamentals in terms of choosing chart types, choosing colors, deciding how wide or narrow to make uh, scales. And so, you know, I, I sort of equate this to like having, you know, bad spelling and grammar in like a written story. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are, uh, how useful your, your insights are. If the basic kind of visuals don't make sense to people, or they're very prone to misinterpretation, or they're very confusing, which is the case in my experience, literally like most of the time then it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how good your insights are, how good your ideas are, because people are going to get tripped up on these, what I consider to be pretty basic data visualization issues. And people often underestimate this and they think, you know, like making the charts is almost kind of an afterthought, uh, you know, and I think, well, you know, how hard can it be, right? You select the data in Excel, you click make chart and boom, you know, there's, there's your chart. Well, you know, the course that I teach, the data visualization fundamentals course that I teach, the shortest I could make it, and it was hard, was 14 hours. Like you, there's a fair amount that you have to know in order to avoid pretty basic kind of data viz spelling and, and vocabulary uh, mistakes. And so it's not very exciting and I'm probably kind of the wet blanket of this panel, but like data stories will fail sometimes because, you know, that we don't understand our audience well enough, or we're just kind of showing the data without enough embellishment. But I, in my experience, the number one reason is just these basic data visualization problems. And then people don't understand the charts and then you're dead in the water, right? Or they misinterpret the charts, which happens all the time. So not very exciting, but yeah, I think to my experience, that's the number one, it's not the only reason why, why data stories fail, but it's the most common one. Yeah, so agreed. Being concise and clear is very important when it comes to telling your stories. Otherwise there would be no point. So Camilla, do you have any challenges that you face working in the entertainment industry or in general regarding data storytelling? Yes, we were working very focused in the part of the streaming business. 
Uh, and we were having like, we have to do an analysis that I think it takes around a month we're working on. So we put all the team, all the effort on that analysis. Once we present it, uh, we, we share all the information, all the graphics, all the presentation, we, we just share into them. And the other day back, I received a Slack asking me for one number that it was on the presentation. So on that point, I say, okay, <laughs> Definitely, there's there are something that we were not doing okay, uh, and we really understand that there were some kind of users uh, and stakeholders that we were working on that they need the chance to swim the data and they don't like need the data so much process. So uh, on that case, when you receive that, when you work on that, and on the other side you say, okay, but I need this number, and you know that it's there, but they don't see it. Uh, it's like also. Uh, some frustrations, you end up the road. But as I always like to say, I think that every failure that you present on these type of projects, it's a new learning that you have to discover. All the days you discover something new because we as people, we are very diverse. We have very different needs, uh, strategic points of view. And I think that every time I receive like a no or no, I don't understand it or it does come from, from this side, I think that it was the chance where I take like the most earnings of all this situation. So uh, in order to, to give more like a hopeless uh, uh, um, uh, and also a, a light on the road, it's, it's common that you're going to see these things. And as uh, well Nick said, uh, it's part of the frustration on the road. But I think that once you take this into an opportunity and advantage and you learn from that, I think you're going to use all the tools and make really good storytelling data. And after that, take it into action. That sounds great. Thank you, Camila. Let's talk more about how our viewers who are uh, just starting off with the data storytelling industry can benefit and can enhance their techniques in the future, right? So how do you keep up with the latest industry trends and advancement in data storytelling? Like what resources do you use to get, stay informed, keep up to date with? So anyone would like to share? Yeah, sure. I actually stay updated on social media. So I spend a ton of time on LinkedIn and then I'm passively able to, you know, see these new trends in my field, see the new libraries that people are using. It, it just, you know, the, the things that are popular enough, they will get in there. And so I'm also on Twitter and Reddit. Um, and, you know, I, I find that Reddit is uh, where you'll see, you know, the more deep, the more technical, um, and they're, you know, really serious about the information that's out there. And so I think like a combination of LinkedIn and Reddit um, is where I'd go. The, definitely social media is very helpful. Agreed. Yes, yeah, totally agree with Kristen. And I want to add there that I love a lot to read. Uh, also, I think like if you have a very good combination between reading books or ebooks, go to social media, like follow uh, some people that, that you want to build on that and, and understand where they're going, where places, uh, also listen to podcasts. I think that we are like living a very interesting era because we have like tons of resources. Also, I, I just saw like a lot of YouTube videos or different people that present. We are in a very good moment because we have the chance to embrace with all this information and also because it adapts or of what we are doing. For example, in my case, uh, I am a lot of time like in cars going from one meet to another, so listen to podcasts for me. It's a very good thing because I have the chance to do some stuff and listen and learn. Uh, so I think that's interesting because uh, we have like very different resources and they really adapt of what uh, we want to do and how it's our day by day. So uh, Chris and Camila, uh, recently on social media or maybe in ebooks on YouTube, have you come across any emerging trend of a technology that you're really excited about and are interested in exploring in the future? I use a lot, a website that I can share it later. It uh, helps you a lot when you have like, for example, different kind of data sets and different kind of data structure they help you to say, okay, if you want to make a comparison, you have to do this type of graphics. If you want to do an uh, like time uh, evolution, you have to do this. Uh, and I think that's great because sometimes we get a little bit like lost when we have to like uh, make uh, some kind of presentation. And I think that uh, helps really a lot. 
And also I use a lot, uh, another tool that it's for uh, color perspective, visuals, uh, when to use red, when to use uh, green to not abuse because they are like quite uh, uh, common colors, but they make a lot of also uh, information when we show it. Uh, so color palettes at also uh, I use different tools uh, and trends over there. And also I think that design trends also uh, there was a time that we have very like charted uh, type of information and presentation. Now we are more like in the clean side of the design. So I think that uh, all that information uh, gave us like a lot of tools. And for me, they are very uh, useful. Those. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it an emerging technology, right? But I'm able to stay up on, for instance, uh, the ggplot in R is like a fantastic library for graphics, and it makes it really easy to build on it. And they've created a number of libraries in Python now that are just a port of that, right? And, and the way that I stay up to date on that is by just being on social media. And I've been playing a lot recently with computer vision and YOLO V8 just came out, you know, and it's like, I see these things and I'm immediately able to get up to date on just, you know, any of the things that are happening, whether it's new libraries being released, you know, or, or people's thoughts on, on the industry. That sounds good. So in the, today's session, we discussed all the challenges that people might encounter, how, they can go about resolving that, uh, dealing with your data storytelling journey. So this was for people in general, right? So my final question to each of the panelists would be that, do you have any advice to give to people who are just starting out on their data storytelling journey? They're taking the initial steps. Nick, would you like to share some thoughts with them? Um, yeah, I, I guess just to maybe sort of recap some of the things that have come up in, in the panel already, especially people who are kind of maybe more junior at the beginnings of their careers, um, they tend to basically just want to kind of live in the data, right? They want to, uh, they're comfortable with data. And so it's not necessarily comfortable for them to say, okay, look, I need to attend more sort of non-data meetings, you know, try to get myself invited to those more, you know, maybe strategic, uh, you know, planning meetings, that kind of thing. Uh, and so, I guess it's, you know, it's not really a skill per se, it's more of an approach of more of an attitude, essentially get out of the data, right? It's, it's a huge problem. I think that, you know, so many analysts just want to live inside of the data, but you have to get out into the organization, even if you maybe don't feel super comfortable doing it. Uh, because if you, if you don't, then of course, you know, don't expect to, to produce data products that are going to be really useful to, uh, to the audience. And then the other is that kind of more self-serving part of like, learn data visualization fundamentals. You know, if your kind of data viz spelling and vocabulary isn't very good, right? If you're choosing inappropriate chart types, inappropriate colors, inappropriate scale ranges, uh, not knowing how to deal with outliers, like uh, all these things, these sort of basics of data visualization, then you're kind of, you know, you're, you're stuck, right? It's, it's hard to get off the ground if you want, unless you've mastered these sort of uh, fundamentals. So those are probably the two pieces of advice that I would, I would give. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kristen. Yeah. So um, Kate Strashney actually just wrote a whole book on color called color wise. It was a book with O'Reilly, right? Cause there's, there's like two pieces to this, right? So there's the piece of, you know, making sure that you are using colors that are going to go well uh, for somebody with color blindness and, and how can you maybe use dotted lines along with straight lines to make sure that people can, can parse the different lines apart. Right. And then there's the other part of the visualization where I think, you know, I'd tell somebody to ask themselves, you know, is this, aggregated is this as high a level as I can get with this right and so you know because when I started I would do a chart for each column I had in the in my data set right it's like so now we're looking by age and now we're looking by tenure and it's like no how do I pull that up how do I say you know, okay, the people who were really doing this thing were young males that were in a couple. And, you know, the people who weren't were older females, da, da, da. Pull, pull all those metrics onto one sheet if possible. It's not always possible. 
not, you know, not all analyses are going to lend really well to being able to come up with like an awesome story. Um, but, you know, just like, you know, when you're done at the end, ask yourself, like, could I bring this up a level? Could I, could I aggregate this more so that the person who is the audience has to do less work to understand what I'm talking about? Thank you, uh, Kristen. Camilla, would you like to share your thoughts next? Yes, definitely. I think that we are living the data era and the AI era. So on that part, I think that storytelling data, it's a, it's a mission, a critical skill. Uh, so I think that everybody that can add that into their portfolio, it's going to add a lot of value, uh, working with data, with models, with AI in everything, uh, to communicate with others, because I think it's a skill that goes you professional level into one, uh, step forward. So I think that that's great to know. And I think that the key here is to uh, translate data analysis into layman's term, no, in order to influence re uh, really a uh, business decision. And as we are discussing here to make it into action. So I think that we can run, as we talk, brilliant analysis on our data, but if we can explain the results or, or take uh, value with that, we are not adding any value. So that's why we are discussing this. We are like uh, paying point of view of that because we understand the impact uh, when we add this into our day by day in our process. So I, I think that it's great to, to put it into the table to discuss in what part it's going to be involved and what we need to do in order to, to, to work on this. Uh, but I think that the, the, the goal is there. Uh, to define a purpose, to understand the final user, uh, as we talk. And uh, with that, I think that you're going to see very quickly uh, the impact of, of adding this into uh, your day by day and, and every project that you are facing. Thank you, Camila. So we're going to move on to the question and answers that our viewers had from today's session. So for starters, uh, there is an opinion, I believe, on isn't data storytelling an advanced way just to tell statistics in a simple language? Would either of you like to talk about this? Do you agree with this statement or would you disagree with this statement? Go ahead, Kristen. So I disagree with the statement just because I have a I have a master's degree in statistics and I find that the majority of people that I've worked with in the analytics don't have super deep statistics background um, and they're still amazing analysts and they're you know creating amazing presentations and, and presenting them well and so I just I think that there's crossover but statistics is like this massive field with a whole lot going on and and analytics also has um, you know its own sort of lots of stuff going on and there's a little bit of crossover with some like p values and, and t tests and stuff but uh for the most part i see them as as two very different things but you know if you're a statistician and you learn how to data storytell you're gonna be a lot more effective for sure agreed agreed thank you Kristen, for that um, so there are a couple of questions regarding ethical considerations when you're using data to tell stories. So personally, how would you suggest to deal with sensitive or personal information? Camilla, do you would like to answer that? I think that uh, mainly that information, it's not just to take it into a storytelling part, uh, because perhaps that is the part of like for the action instead. Uh, uh, when we talk uh, or we present something with sensitive information or personal information, we not put names or something like that. We talk more like for clusters or for groups uh, because that's not like the main point or, or where we want to go. Of course, once we have made that analysis, perhaps that finished with making a campaign with some uh, groups or, or something like that. But always like the information, it's sensitive. Uh, most of the companies have their information encrypted with with uh, personal keys or, or secret keys in order to make that uh, very private because I think that uh, the private, the data privacy part and the data uh, also governance part of this, it's like very, very important. And when we use it, we have to be very careful and with what scope we are going to present that. It's also our responsibility uh, and we need to, to take care of that, of course. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, so there is one more question and I would really like Nick to answer this. Uh, so the question is that, is there a template that you can adhere to for capturing a data story? 
No, because as I was mentioning before, right, data stories can be prompted by all sorts of, you know, origins, right? Sometimes it's uh, somebody who's asked us for analysis about something. Uh, sometimes it's a question that somebody has asked. Sometimes it's something that we have discovered, which we need to share with the audience, right? Uh, sometimes it's it's something that's completely new to them, and we're trying to persuade them to do uh, to do something different. I, I think it is the kind of thing that is that is quite difficult to to template. Uh, if you maybe just picked one of those things, like for example, saying, "Okay, how would you build a persuasive data story?" And so specifically, where the objective is to get the audience to actually do something. At that point, yeah, you can maybe start to talk about some general principles, like for example, you know, you start with the status quo, right? This is the way things are. And then you introduce, you know, some kind of challenge as well. And then it caused this problem or then this new event happened. And then you have some kind of uh, resolution or, or solution. And, and then hopefully the, the audience then sort of uh, accepts that. But just in general, like a template for kind of data stories, I think there's just so many different reasons why you would want to create a data story uh, in the first place. And oftentimes, you know, uh, like I said, in my experience anyways, you don't actually necessarily need those sort of more advanced storytelling techniques, which is mostly what we've been talking about here. And I think that that's also maybe something to keep in mind is because as you know, I think Camilla was saying, like data storytelling is really hot right now. <laughs> like it's, you know, everybody's talking about it. It's a big trend. And so people often feel a pressure to, you know, basically tell a story around everything. But in my experience, it's maybe necessary like 10 or 20% of the time. And most of the time, if it's just a straightforward question you've been asked, a straightforward answer is fine. And you don't necessarily have to have, you know, characters or a narrative arc or cause and effect. It's just, no, like, here's here's the answer with some interpretation, with some embellishment, you know, maybe some highlighting, or maybe we've added some reference values for comparison or something like that. And so maybe that's another takeaway is like, don't feel that you have to have an elaborate story for everything. In my experience, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of the time, uh, it's, it's actually uh, necessary. I don't know if the others would agree or disagree. I'd be interested. Totally agree. Okay. Totally agree. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here today. Unfortunately, I have to close the curtain.